Welcome to the Big Game Hunting Podcast, where we help hunters like you prepare for the big game hunting adventures you've always dreamed of. Now, here's your host, John McAdams. Hello, I'm John McAdams. Thank you so much for joining me today for episode 57 of the Big Game Hunting Podcast. Now, like I've mentioned a couple of times in previous episodes, I have an Arizona coos deer hunt coming up in late December. Coos deer are an interesting animal. They're technically white-tailed deer, but they live in the deserts of Arizona, New Mexico, West Texas, and Mexico. They also don't get nearly as big as their mule deer and eastern white-tailed cousins in terms of antler or body size. However, those creatures have a certain effect on hunters who have pursued them. Indeed, many hunters that live in the Southwest are absolute fanatics about coos deer hunting. Now, in addition to being a fun animal to hunt in general, Arizona has great coos deer hunting, a lot of public land, and coos deer tags there are much easier to obtain than mule deer tags. Heck, you can even buy an archery coos deer tag over the counter and then head down there to hunt during the rut in January, which also has the benefit of taking place after deer season are closed in many parts of the United States. Now, I won't be hunting there during the rut, or at least not during the peak of the rut anyway. I drew a rifle coos deer tag for late December in a unit in southern Arizona, and that's actually the next hunt coming up on my schedule. So with all that in mind, today I'm going to be interviewing Jay Scott of Jay Scott Outdoors, who knows a whole lot more about coos deer hunting than I do. Now, my friend Fred Bohm and I talked about coos deer hunting all the way back in episode 9. That episode does provide a good overview of what coos deer are, where they live, and generally how to hunt them. Today, Jay and I are going to go into a whole lot more detail on the finer points of coos deer hunting and exactly how to go about hunting these wily desert whitetails. Okay, ready to get started? So Jay Scott has been a professional hunting guide in Arizona since 1997. His primary focus has been on coos deer, mule deer, elk, bighorn sheep, and Gould's turkey. He's part owner of Colburn and Scott Outfitters and runs the Jay Scott Outdoors podcast. It's good to have you with us today, Jay. Can you tell us a little bit more about your hunting background and how you first got addicted to coos deer hunting? You know, coos deer are an amazing animal. Um, they're, they're so wary. Uh, they're so aware of everything that's around them. You know, they're, they're constantly getting chased by predators every day. So, um, you know, when you get to watch them and observe them, uh, and a lot of people that have gone out and seen them for the first time are no different than when I did. Uh, you just kind of get captivated by them uh, since they're such a dainty, small animal and they're constantly on alert. Uh, they just have a way to, you know, crawl under your skin and get to where, you know, you, they really become an animal that you really enjoy hunting. And my story with them is really no different. Um, soon as I was able to start uh, looking and observing uh, a coos deer, I was pretty much hooked and, um, you know, I've, I've hunted them every season since then. And, you know, I'm probably going on 25 years now of hunting coos deer and, I uh, guide an outfit, uh, in primarily in Mexico, uh, Northern Sonora for coos deer. And I think this will be my 22nd, might be my 23rd year, uh, of going down there and spending, you know, roughly 30 days, um, you know, just, just watching them. Uh, we like hunting them during the rut. Um, that's, that's a huge part of, uh, the fun of watching them chase does and make scrapes and fight other bucks. It's just, they're an awesome, awesome animal. You know, man, it's, like, like you said, you've been doing it for a long time and you've got, it sounds like you've got a ton of coos deer hunts under your belt, both ones that you've guided other people on. And, you know, in addition to the ones that you've, you've been the, uh, the tag holder and the trigger puller yourself, with all of those stories or with all of those coos deer hunts that you've been on, is there one story that kind of st sticks out uh, that you'd like to share with us? Oh, man. I mean, there's some, you know, routinely for the last, you know, 20 plus years, you know, normally I'll see anywhere from, you know, 10 to, you know, 20 deer, maybe even more than 20 um you know, 10 to 20 coos deer a year get shot and harvested. Um, you know, there's so many unbelievable stories. You know, it always seems as though some of the biggest deer um, that we've been able to find and locate and harvest 
uh, you know, th those stories seem to stick in the back of our mind. You know, just a, a recent one, uh, my, my guiding partner and I, Dark Colburn, were down in Sonora, Mexico, scouting before our hunts, and we saw big deer, uh, uh, not a very wide deer, probably only 10 and a half. Actually, I think he ended up being 11 inches wide inside, um, but he scored 141 inches. Oh, my goodness. Uh, official. Jeez. And, um, you know, he's, not, he's, he's one of the bigger deer that, that we've been a part of. Uh, but, you know, the interesting thing about that is we saw him on a particular hillside uh, in December when we were down there scouting. And um, when we came back with the hunters, we had seven days. Uh, you know, we had a group of, of guys and we had to kind of draw straws and make it fair for everyone. So everyone had a chance to get the buck and, uh, it took us till the very last day of the season to find, to relocate the buck, uh, again. And the funny thing is he was probably a hundred yards from where the last place we saw him in December, where we had videoed him. And that just goes to show coos deer are an unbelievable animal. They're very habitual, uh, and they stay in a kind of a short, tight circle pretty much their whole life. And it just goes to show, I mean, we, we constantly were applying pressure to that area with, you know, you know, at, at times four or five guys glass, glassing in one area for that deer. And it wasn't until the last uh, day uh, that that buck was harvested or seen. And the reality is he was right there the whole time. So that just kind of paints a picture for anybody out there that, you know, hasn't had a chance to hunt coos deer to just um, hear how, you know, a big deer, especially a, a big deer of that caliber, um, you know, and so much focus and attention trying to get that deer spotted. And he was able to elude us. And I'm confident that he was there the whole time. He just was uh, not moving around a whole lot. And then once he exposed himself, um, that's all it took. But he ended up up dying about a hundred yards from the original spot where we saw him. My goodness, man. You know, so, you know, a hundred, 140 inch coos deer, that's, that's a massive, absolutely massive coos deer, isn't it? Yeah. You know, to put it in perspective, um, you know, the Boone and Crockett minimum for typical is, uh, 110, the Boone and Crockett, uh, minimum for non-typical is 120. And, um, so he's well above both of those marks and he's just a freaky, a uh, non-typical buck, um, you know, and we, we've been fortunate to, uh, you know, I love big deer. Um, I love big elk. I love big rams. I love big mule deer. You know, I love chasing um, trophy record book quality um, deer. And not that I don't like chasing any type of coos deer, but, it, it, you know, after you do it this long, certainly some of the big ones, uh, definitely stick in my mind. I was able to harvest the biggest buck I've ever personally shot was 133 and 6 eighths. Um, he netted 131. That was the desert deer. Um, that, that deer, uh, was, you know, I looked for that. Deer. We had a trail camera picture of the deer from a couple months prior. And I spent a couple of weeks, um, hunting that deer and not seeing a whole lot and just staying consistent and staying and, you know, trying to look in that area and finally glass them up. And, uh, he was, he was a beautiful deer for sure. But yeah, 140, you know, it, it really anything over a hundred and it's pretty exceptional in the coos deer, uh, world. And, you know, the deer, the coos deer, you know, generally between 105 to 110 pounds a mature buck. So, you start getting a 110 inch rack, uh, on a, on a deer of that size, they just look, uh, uh, really, really big. I've had a lot of Midwest whitetail hunters come out and hunt coos deer and, you know, they're used to seeing, you know, 160, 170, even 180 inch class type, uh, whitetails. And, um, it's funny when they see a hundred and, you know, 110, 115 inch coos deer or better, they just lose their mind because the rack looks so big on the body. Huh. Yeah, so is is that one of the things that just makes them so addicting? You know, like you said, in in uh, absolute terms, their antlers don't get as big as a mule deer or mini eastern whitetail, and their body isn't nearly as big either. But that kind of mis mismatch between the small body size with the, the antlers appearing larger relative to their body, is that one of the reasons that some guys love hunting them so much? 
Yeah, I mean, for sure. But I think a lot of it, too, is the country that they live in, you know, the yellow grass that, the, you know, they come in all, all shapes and sizes. The terrain comes in all shapes and sizes. But, you know, you're generally around that elevation of three, four, five thousand 5,000 feet. And you get a lot of that yellow grass. You get a lot of that, you know, mesquite and oak. Oak and you know the open yellow hillsides on the south facing slopes. You've got the you know thicker vegetation on the north, um, and and they're just a you know incredible animal to watch. They're beautiful. Um, you know when they flag their beautiful white tail up, um, it's just they're they're a magical deer. Uh, pretty much everyone I know that has hunted them just uh, can't get enough, and most people that hunt them once. Uh, you know, they, it, it becomes very quickly one of their favorite animals. It's so glassing oriented. Uh, so, if, you know, if, if glassing and, and looking, uh, you know, for long periods of time over lots of country is something that intrigues you, uh, coos deer is, 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 is something you should definitely try and pursue. So you, you, you touch briefly on uh, the areas that they live and how beautiful they are. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. How What's a good way? How do you identify good coos deer habitat? You know, for for someone that has never done this before, hasn't spent a lot of time in this country. It's very big. Where do you start? Well, um, you know, I talk a lot about on on my podcast. Um, we talk a lot about coos deer, coos deer habitat, and uh, strategies and tactics and all of that. I think you've got to break your unit down and. You know, there's some units in Arizona that are, you know, they have everything. They basically have desert floor all the way up the different um, zones, if you will, all the way up into the pines. I think one of the things that I look at is um, the topography and where can I get to gain an optical advantage where I can be in a good glassing position uh, in order to a lot of country. And I think it's important to figure out where the road structures are, where the access points are for hunters in the area. And, and you know, it's it's one of those things that once you have a grasp on where the most pressure is going to come from the other hunter, I base my, my attack, uh, if you will, uh, based on I know other people are going to be coming from, and I either try and use that in my image or I try and in areas where um, those people are not, or they're going to be overlooking. Um, when I'm going out, most of the time I'm looking for older, mature um, trophy, you know, bigger deer. And those deer, you know, the, the bigger deer live in those places where the people aren't getting to. And sometimes it's it's rough country. Sometimes it's country that's remote and then sometimes it's country that it might be right off a highway or right off a main road that people just go blowing by um you know i think the most beautiful country too you have to be a little bit leery of because that's where most people like to go hunt so sometimes the lower or the higher you know the thicker higher country up and you know the more brushy and pines uh, you can find some bigger deer and then down in the more lower desert where you're not going to see very many deer, but you, you might happen to catch, you know, a big deer. Those are kind of the things I look at, you know, and I think it all depends on what unit. Uh, Arizona is so, there's so many variations in the units. Um, so once, if I know, if someone's asking me advice, once I know the unit they're hunting, then I can give a little bit more detailed advice based on that unit if I've hunted it and have experience there because they're all different. I mean, the coos deer, you know, they, they'll live anywhere from, you know, that 2,000 to 9,000 feet, but that sweet spot is kind of that 3,500 to 5,000 feet elevation is, is a good rule of thumb. You know, for hunts uh, that take place for coos deer, like in the December, January time frame, how important is, is water? to finding them dry like it is now we haven't had any moisture it's to know exactly where your water sources are we get you know we're sitting here the eighth of November or so and been very very dry uh those deer have to water it's it's hot it's dry uh if we get some rain 
basically, you know, a decent rain or two will fill up all of the canyon bottoms and all of the creek, you know, creek bottoms that are dry will all have potholes and all have water in them. So once some rain uh, storms come in, those deer will be able to spread out a little bit and not be so concentrated on, you know, water sources. Whereas right now, as dry as it's been, uh, um, you know, I would probably focus my efforts, uh, you know, within at least a mile of water, if not a half mile of water. Uh, December and January is an interesting time because, uh, you know, at the end of December and certainly the month of January, those deer are rutting and they're, they're, that's their breeding season. And so bucks are constantly chasing does and they're on the move making scrapes and they're up and active a lot more. And when they're up and active a lot more, they're going to require more water. Uh, when they really get to chasing does and really running around and fighting, um, you know, that's going to make them go and hit water more. So, uh, you know, definitely water is, is something I think about in December and January. Um, I, I place more emphasis on being knowing where your water sources are, though, say on the October or the November hunts. Uh, just because, you know, that's more of a dry season and they, you know, they have to be fairly close to water. I would say within a mile of water. Um, and, and the closer you can get to water, the more deer you're going to find. So this big buck that you were telling us about earlier, you know, that you, that you saw, then didn't see him for several weeks and then ended up killing him right next to where you saw him. Sounds like that guy probably had a great spot there where he was, real close to some water, had some good a good food source there, and then some security where he was able to get everything he needed without traveling a great distance. Is that what you, yeah, you I agree mean, with that? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's like most any big mature animals. You know, they've got their place where they've got a water source and they've got their place where they've got feed and cover. And, you know, it's, it, a, a big deer typically won't camp out really close to the water. They'll like to have a little bit of a distance where they can walk uh, and get water and then come back. In other words, they don't want to sleep on, you know, they don't want to make their home right on top of a water source because what comes with water is also for predators. Um, you'll oftentimes find does, you know, will be within three, four, five, six hundred yards of, of a water source, but typically the bucks. You know, if I had to say, they're probably seven, eight hundred yards. You know, up, you know that half mile, for, a little more than a quarter mile, but probably more like half mile away from water. Um, and you know, depending on the activity level and such, they don't have to drink every day. Uh, they can get their vegetate, they can get their moisture through vegetation uh, as well. But certainly, and when you go through these um, hot, dry spells we've had in Arizona where they, you know, literally goes 45 days or so without any moisture. Um, they definitely will tighten up around the water sources. Well, that definitely makes sense. Um, you I don't just, know if I answered your question. I kind of got, I kind of get to rambling, but, uh, see, sometimes you might have to bounce uh, me back on track. No, no worries. <laughs> it, it, it's a complicated question, uh, that there's, that there's a lot going on to. And in many cases, it sounds like the answer just depends, but it sounds like, yeah, he wants to be close to water, but not, super super close to water because you make a good point about the predators because uh i'll bet they can they can uh the mountain lions can really take a bite out of them uh uh in that neck of the woods right yeah i mean mountain lions um are certainly a a, a huge you know factor for you know lions kill a lot of coos deer and they kill a lot of coos deer bucks uh and those those deer you know the does and bucks they're pretty keen on, you know, trying to stay alive and they learn very quickly, you know, where a good place is and, and not, um, so, you know, that's just part of it. Um, you know, it's th those big mature bucks, uh, the older they get, it seems like, and it's, it's no different really than a big bull elk or a big, you know, Midwest whitetail, uh, buck. you know, the older they get, it seems like the tighter the circle and the less they travel. And the more that they're, you know, I call them homebody, where they're just kind of staying in one spot and, you know, not out where you'll have like a two-year-old buck that will just be roaming all over, um, you know, just more, you know, curiosity, wanting to kind of, 
you know, get in and get in the established pecking order, whereas a big giant, you know, mature deer is going to stay tight. Um, you know, doesn't really have to move around too much. Um, so yeah, they're, you know, big cooster bucks are amazing animals and, uh, they're, they're super fun to try and figure out. You know, so you mentioned earlier how much you enjoy glassing for, for coos deer and how that's one of your, uh, primary ways of finding them. Can you kind of explain uh, the process that you use once you find a good spot that you like to glass from, you know, I, how, how do you do things over the course of the yeah, day? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, I mean, one of the biggest, most important thing that, that you and your listeners, um, I think, could get value from is you have to glass for cooster off of a tripod, but that's not even negotiable in my book. You have to have a steady platform. Uh, I, 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 I um, suggest that people sit down comfortably on, you know, on a, either a glassing stool or on just a pad, you know, um, and just sit there, pod leg, you know, extend it out, form, and then you just begin the country at flight, uh, hitting uh, for the first 20, 30 minutes. I'm going to be literally shot. I call it shotgun glassing. I'm going to be really scanning, pan, air. I'm not going to have any real um, thematic pattern on hitting like saddles i'm hitting those and i'm looking at areas where I'm fine here because a lot of the first 30 minutes the first hour of the sun coming up you know they're they're out in the more open area or visible you know we be hitting them uh, i just want to see and those easy pickings uh you know i want to i want to pick up ones and then and as, you know, say an hour after sun up, then I'm going to more start slowing down. I'm going to then take and get a little bit more methodical, a little bit more grid pattern oriented. I'm going to take what's in front of me and kind of, you know, work from left to right, right to left, you know, just panning back and forth in a horizontal fashion. I typically will start at the top of the hill and pan back across, and I'm, I'm basically sweeping it as if, as if that, um, you know, what I'm looking at through the field of view of my binos is basically a canvas, and I'm basically just sweeping from left to right and back and forth, starting from the top, moving down, trying to pick up deer. Uh, and, you know, as that morning is progressing, I am then really focusing on shaded areas. I'm focusing on where those bucks are going to want to start you know, feeding in the open, and then they start moving into the more shaded areas. Then they're still feeding, but they're quickly in a shaded pocket, either behind trees, brush, rocks, uh, or the, the slope of a hill. Uh, and then, you know, as the morning continues to progress, then they start getting close to where they're going to bed down. You can kind of see them looking around for a spot to bed. Uh, and then they bed down. Um, when that time period is going on, then I'm really focusing on the shady side of the hills uh, and trying to look into the brush, um, trying to look for deer that are bedded. I'm looking for their antlers. I'm looking, you know, the, the, the shape of their antlers. I'm looking for their black noses. I'm looking for ears to twitch, um, looking for bedded deer. Uh, and it's super important that the, listeners understand that you'll you'll find a lot more deer if you're looking on the right side of the hill in other words if you're looking on the sunny side of the hill at 10 o'clock in the morning the likelihood is you're not going to see many deer uh, but if you're looking into the sun uh, you know on the shady slopes you're going to their percentage wise you're going to see more deer because you're looking in the area where the deer actually are uh, and then you know I always talk about the 10 to 2 uh, shade change where that buck will have been bedded for a couple of hours and now the sun will have progressed across the sky and now that position that was shaded for the last couple of hours uh, is not shaded anymore and typically between that 10 and 2 time frame, they're going to get up at least one time and they're going to feed, they're going to go to the bathroom, they're going to feed for 5 or 10 minutes and then they're going to rebed. And that second bed that they, they lay in, is they're going to be there for quite a while. Um, so 
that is a time frame, you know, glassing in the shaded basins uh, between 10 and 2 is a lot of times when I found bucks uh, that I never saw all morning. And I've been glassing right there, and then all of a sudden they got up between 10 and 2, and they made their little bit of a feed, and then, you know, for ten, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, and then they bed down. And then once they bed down, that's your opportunity to move in closer because uh, they're probably going to be there a while. That's your opportunity to move in closer to get in position, shooting position uh, of their location. And um, then as, as the day progresses, all my afternoon glassing is all with the sun in my face, uh, always looking on the shaded slopes because 90% or more of your gear will be in shaded uh, spots, whether it be shaded cuts, shaded hillsides, you know, big slopes that are completely shaded. You can almost predict where those deer are going to be. So I've heard you mention that you prefer shade or looking in general on north, northeast, and east-facing slopes, uh, just because it sounds like that's where the deer are more likely to be. Is that is that a good description? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly in the early season hunts, um, and I call early season anything up until January, uh, you'll find more deer. If you if you looked only at north, northeast, and east facing slopes, you're going to find more deer. Uh, as January comes and you get more of that rutting activity, you definitely see a lot of the does will live on south facing slopes on more of the open slopes uh, and. Uh, you know, you, you can, um, you can predict that those does will be in the open, but the bucks, they're, they're going to want to stay as cool as possible. So they're going to, they're going to be on those shadier slopes. The one thing I like about east facing slopes is you've got sun in the morning and shade in the afternoon. So you can use the benefit of the, the sun at your back, looking at an east facing slope, the, the sun obviously, uh, rises, uh, in the east the sun will be at your back, you're looking at an east-facing slope, so you have the benefit of the sun making those deer shine. And then as the you know sun progresses across the sky, it then starts creating shade, and all afternoon, all the way till dark, that whole east-facing slope is, is in the shade. Um, most bucks will prefer to always be in the shadiest, to the slope that they can find um you know it's not saying that deer aren't on west facing slopes or south facing slopes because they are and bucks are uh, but you can almost predict if you're glass in a south facing slope uh you want to know where are those little cuts where are the places on the west and on the south where those deer can get a little bit of shade um, and they become super predictable just by looking at okay that's a south facing slope, but there's a little cut there, and look, it's shaded. Well, that's where the deer are going to be. Deer do not lay in the sunshine uh, very, very often uh, at all, and so I, you know, may live in basically glassing into the shade uh, and and finding deer. And you know, I glass with so many people when they want to put the sun at their back in the afternoon because yes, if you do see a deer, you know, it shines. Yes, that's true, but you're, you know, you're missing probably 90% of the deer uh, that are just over in the next tuck or next, you know, they're, they're tucked over in the next fold over that's in the shade. Go, go out into a new area. It looks promising, you know, on Google Earth and, and all that stuff, and it, uh, it looks, okay, this, this could be coos deer habitat when you look at it, and you go out there and you glass and you don't see anything um, is... I know part of it, you know, right there, the gray ghosts, they're hard to find, but is this also a deal? Like, at what point do you're like, you know what, this place isn't, isn't worth my time, I'm going to move on to, to some other place? Well, I think it's a little bit of a gut feeling. Uh, you know, there's been so many times where I've had just, you know, illusions of grandeur and go out on Google Earth and it's just the greatest spot and you get there and, you know, you don't see anything. A lot of times, uh, if I don't see any deer at all, um, that's going to raise some red flags to me. Um, you know, if I'm seeing does, um, 
you know, then I go, okay, I, I see, I'm seeing a bunch of does, but no bucks. Um, if, you know, I'm confident that there's deer there in that area and that it's a real bucky looking spot, you know, one time going out and glassing doesn't determine whether that's a good spot or not. Um, if you sit there long enough, you know, day after day after day, you're probably going to be able to determine that's, that's not a great spot and you need to move on. I think it's one of the biggest uh, hurdles that hunters have to face, including myself, of trying to figure out where to go and trying to figure out that happy medium of, you know, how much do I move and how much do I just stay put. Um, I usually like to choose big looks where I can tons the country that also have, you know, smaller little isolated knobs in between me and where I'm looking. Um, you know, so I get up high, as high as I can, maybe on the first go around. Um, and then if I don't see anything, I might switch to one of the more medium sized knobs and try and get a little bit closer. Uh, and then, you know, if I ultimately determine that, Hey, I'm just not seeing what I want, I'll just move and find another knob. I think it's important important when you're scouting you know if you're doing your e-scouting have a bunch of different vantage points so you could basically at any given time bounce over and hit new country and just kind of move until you see and find what you're looking for um you know i'm certainly looking for points that i can be looking at east and north and northeast um facing slopes uh, and where I can very easily just l literally uh, just turn into, you know, whether I sit in the same position or have to move over 10 yards or 30 yards, or I can be looking at a totally different piece of country. I love cone knobs um, where I've got options to last for 30 minutes or an hour off one side and then move over 40, 30, 40 yards and be looking at a totally different canyon. So when you're picking those knobs, Cone, cone beaks knobs or rock piles are, are great because from a cone knob, I can basically sit in one position uh, without having to move very far and rotate 360 degrees and see all kinds of country. So it sounds like, um, one, if you're seeing any deer, right, you're seeing does, that's a good sign. That means there's probably something about that basin that the deer in general like, and while the buck may not be right there with them, he may be in that general area, Right. Not necessarily. I mean, a lot of times if I'm, if all I'm seeing is does and lots of does, I'm kind of in a, a doe spot, a nursery spot. Um, on the October, November, and early December hunts, that's not, not a good thing. I want to be seeing bucks, and I'd rather see more bucks than does. Um, you know, if you're talking a late December, if you've got a late December tag and you're talking like Christmas time to New Year's, and or you're talking these OTC Arizona hunts where you're hunting – uh, you know, in, in January, then yeah, if you're seeing a lot of does, that's a great spot because bucks will come. Um, in, in the early season, I don't be seeing a lot of does. Uh, in late season or, you know, the rut season, I definitely, if I'm seeing does, uh, that's a good sign and certainly the bucks will cycle through. And if I on a knob and, you know, if I'm and no bucks, and, you know, I'm hunting a December hunt and it's, you know, the 20, you know, 20, 21st, 2nd of December. I know that probably if I come back about the 28th or 9th of December that all of a sudden there's going to be a bunch of bucks with does. Um, you know, you just got to gauge which hunt do you have. Seeing too many does in, in you know, in a non-rut time frame is, not advisable because you're probably in what I call a nursery. Uh, you need to go to a little bit steeper, a little bit rougher, a little bit more remote country, uh, and get where you're not seeing as many does. Okay, definitely makes sense. Now, you've also made a real point of talking about how um, the direction that you're looking is extremely important to you. You know, more than anything else, you're really emphasizing, like you said, those north, northeast, and east-facing slopes. How important is the wind direction, though, when, when you're glassing? Or are you set up so far away oftentimes that that's not an issue? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really consider the wind uh, much until I'm planning to make a stop on a deer. Um, certainly, I don't want my wind blowing up into a basin or down into a basin or, you know, if I'm 
if it's just blowing right at the deer where I think the deer is. Um, but most all of the time, when I pick those cone peaks and knobs, if the wind is blowing, if we've got a front coming in and there's really heavy wind coming out of one direction, you can almost predict that those deer are going to be in those places where on the lee side. So you always want to have the wind in your face. So the wind in your face is, uh, means that you are looking with the wind into your face. That means whatever you're looking at, they are using the hill to shield the wind that's hitting in your face, and they're on the lee side. So just like the, you can predict where those deer are going to be bedded and where they're going to be laying with the sun and, you know, the shade, um, you can very easily pick two if you have a predominant wind coming out of one direction. You know, if we have a two- or three-day storm where it's just howling and blowing, you know, out of the west, uh, you know, really, really hard, you can predict, and this goes for any animal, to be honest with you, they're going to be on the less windy side of the hill because they don't like wind as much as we do. Um, they want to get in and tuck in and get, get, you know, some cover and some shelter. Uh, the reason they do that, uh, the, what I speculate, uh, is that they want to be able to where they can hear, and, and if the wind is rustling around and they can't hear, that just kills one of their senses from trying to stay alive with predators. So I think animals in general, uh, they try and get out of the wind just as if we would, um, comfortable. Uh, a lot of guys will glass on the lee side themselves and they're looking onto the windy side just because it's not comfortable to glass in. I do the opposite. I want to get, if it's windy, I want the wind in my face. Uh, yes, it's going to blow my tripod. Yes, it's going to blow my binoculars. But a lot of times you'll end up seeing way more animals because you're looking where they're at uh, just by facing the correct direction into the wind. Okay, so now let's say you found a big deer or rather a deer that you consider a shooter. Um, what kind of considerations do you need to keep in mind uh, going from, okay, I've spotted them. Now I need to get within rifle range of it. Yeah, so, the, I mean, Don and I always laugh. That's like chapter one, page three. Um, we always laugh about this book, this um, fictitious book that we've written, you know, that just isn't even, it's just a make-believe book. But um, we never like to get within 300 yards of a deer we want to kill. That's a rule of thumb we've used for a long, long time. We typically shoot our deer between 300 and 400 yards, uh, and I'm perfectly fine if you know, it's right at 400 and, and, and even further. Uh, but I never want to get inside of 300 yards. If I've, if I've gotten into a position that's under 300, something has gone severely awry. Uh, if you can use kind of that as a general rule of thumb, as a buffer to keep between you and the deer, you are going to spook way less deer and your chances of getting a good clean shot is going to be much better. Once you get inside of 300 yards of a deer, uh, a lot of times they know you're there. And when they know you're there, your chances of getting a nice, good, clean shot uh, where they're totally unaware that you're, you know, in the area, it, it, it goes way down. So stay outside of 300 yards is one. Um, and two, uh, if you have someone that's hunting with you, uh, it's always important to keep a spotter on the deer. I will, unless I'm hunting completely by myself, I will never make an approach on a deer without having a spotter. Now in Arizona, it's legal to use radios, um, to, to hunt and pursue deer. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, I will have someone stay on the deer, me and the hunter, or if I'm the hunter, I'll, I'll then, uh, get into shooting position on a knob that's, you know, say 375 to 400 yards away. I'll get into position, and the spotter's job is to watch that deer, watch and not take a break. Uh, so it's important that if you have a spotter, they realize how important their p job is. Their job is to make sure that that deer is still in the same position so that when the, sh the hunter is going over to a vantage point to get into a shooting position, that they know once they arrive that everything is the same, nothing has changed. If you're not going to use radios, you have to have some sort of signaling of, 
number one, the signal of the buck's gone. You, they've seen you. The gig is up. So that that can tell the shooter, okay, I need to come back to the to, to the spotter's position. Uh, and number two, you have to have a signal that says no change. The deer is exactly where he was. And then from there, it gets a little more complex. If the deer jump, you know, um, stood up and started feeding, and he went up the hill 50 yards, you have to have a way to be able to say everything's fine, but the deer moved uphill or downhill or left or right 50 yards. Uh, and so that's where a radio comes into play, where it's a lot of fun uh, to say the deer, you, you know, the shooter's in position, and the shooter calls back to the spotter and says, what do you got? The deer never moved. He's right there. And so now the shooter can say, okay, spotter, you're either going to stay there and stay in position, or now you can leapfrog over and bounce, bounce over here to me. If you're hunting with a friend, it's highly advisable to never take your deep eyes off of a deer that you want to kill, ever. I mean, not to get in your pack to get a sandwich, not to you know take a leak, not to do anything. Your job as a spotter is to make sure that however long it takes the shooter to get in position, your one job and sole job is to make sure that that deer did not move and did not move out of position so that you don't spend all day sitting till dark waiting for a deer to get up and, oh, yeah, I, I got up to get a sandwich and take a lead and, you know, uh, it took me five minutes and that deer's gone and you just wasted your whole afternoon. Gosh, that's got to be a terrible feeling, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's only happened to us a couple times, you know, in, in the last 20 plus years, just because we're so adamant with anybody that hunts with us that, you know, one of the most important jobs, if you're the spotter, is you do not leave your post for any reason. You stay in the binos and you make sure that, you know, that deer has not got up in your watch. Uh, and it's a real, you know, effective way. Those coos deer can be so slippery uh, and so so very hard to kill. So having a spotter, again, if you're not using radios, the good thing is leave the spotter on the deer. Let the, you know, have a predetermined point. You say, I'm going to go over and get on that point over there. I'm going to look back at you for the signal of everything's good or no, come back here that this deal's over or everything's good, but the deer's moved positions. Once I get established over in the shooting position and I've looked back, and you've given me the signal, then you come to me. But you don't come to me till I give you the signal that I'm all set up, my gun set up, my tripod set up, I'm in ready position. Uh, and then you, as the hunter, you signal back to the, to the spotter saying, okay, now you can leapfrog over to me. At that point, now the shooter or the hunter, it's their sole job to keep an eye on this whole situation. So don't signal your spotter to move until you've gone the bathroom, gotten your water out for a long day sit, gotten your food out of your pack, have your pack set where your gun's in a, you know, shooting position, lay down behind the gun and, you know, kind of look through the scope and be like, okay, there's the rock pile and the dead tree where the buck's at. Everything's ready to go so that when, if the spotter takes an hour to get to you and your subject buck gets up or, does whatever he needs to do, you're totally ready to go, uh, as well as, you know, you've got your food, you've got your water sitting out so that you don't have to be digging in your pack, because your job is to then stay in your binos uh, and watch uh, until the subject, I mean, it's a real tactical military type uh, tactic, you know, like you just, you, I always say, treat these coos deer as if they're going to shoot back at you, if, if, if this is a a gunfight, you're going to do everything you can to be um, not seen, uh, you know, be, you're going to be quiet, you're not going to be out in the open, you're going to be in a good sniper tactical position where, you know, it's almost like as soon as that deer gives you a shot opportunity, you're going to shoot him before he shoots you. So if everything in an ideal situation would be that you found a good spot where, where there's deer, you're glassing for them, looking around first thing in the morning when they're more likely to be up. You find a buck while he's on his feet. You watch him bed. Then you watch him until he gets up and, and kind of adjusts around midday and beds again. And then you move in, hopefully get a good shooting location where you're within range but not too close. And then 
you just wait there until he stands up and hopefully the deer follows the script and and that's how it uh that's how it all ends there yeah and if you if you keep that buffer if things don't work out and if for whatever reason the buck gets up but he's behind the tree and you know if you're far enough away and you can let it get dark and you can sneak out of there you can repeat the process the next day because more than likely you're going to relocate the buck the next day. The last thing you want to do with this crazy stuff, and I've done it, and I see it a lot, is, oh, I don't know if he's still bedded there, so I'm going to send so-and-so over there and try and, you know, push the hillside and get him up. All that, all that stuff never works. I shouldn't say never. It very rarely works. So I look at it from a very tactical, strategic standpoint of I never want the deer to know I'm there at all. I don't want him to know the spotter's there. I don't want him to know the shooter's there. I want to be able to pick my uh, glassing position and shooting position from a standpoint of I don't want anybody, know, you know, the deer knowing that I'm even in the country so that if it doesn't work out that day, I can come back tomorrow and nothing's been disturbed. The last thing you want to do is be like, well, You know, it's hot, and I don't want to sit here all day, so I'm going to, you know, start throwing rocks and see if I can get them up. I I highly encourage hunters, don't do that kind of stuff. Just sit there, um, be in a good position. That's part of picking uh, a good shooting position. Get over where you've got good vantage, where you can look into the spot where the deer is. Pick a spot where you've maybe got a tree or some bushes that you can be on the shady side of that so you know, the, the afternoon sun isn't just pounding you in the face. Um, you know, pick a spot where if you need to get up to use the restroom or something, you can move, you know, f- five feet away and not be out in the open, uh, but be able to get right back into your binos or get back into the gun. Um, and, you know, picking, uh, you always want to have that optical advantage. Um, I think being above the animal is always good where you're kind of looking down and across. Uh, where you have real good uh, uh, field of view. It uh, seems like when you get below a deer, your field of view goes way, way down. Um, you know, being able to shoot down and across is, is is a huge optical advantage for sure. And it also seems like, too, you need to be prepared to be sitting out there for basically all, all day long. You're out there before daylight, you're ready to go when the sun comes up, bring lunch, bring snacks, and then... Uh, be prepared to stay out there until it's too dark to see anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's how the guys that do it routinely and kill big mature deer is they're, they're there all day. They don't have a mentality of, Oh, I didn't bring lunch and I didn't bring snacks and I don't have enough water. And no, I mean, when I pack my bag in the morning, my backpack, you know, I'm, I'm ready to be out there all day. I can, you know, if it's cold, if it's hot, I can, I can, if it's going to rain, I can withstand whatever's, you know, going to come my way. And, and, um, you know, we take it really seriously, obviously, obviously. Uh, but that's part of the fun of it is, you know, the strategy and the tactics. And, um, you know, I, I talk about it being efficient. You know, I talk about it on my podcast, being efficient, um, killing, you know, I don't take killing things lightly and uh, yet try and be as effective and as as efficient as I can, you know, having good communication, uh, with your spotters. Uh, and if you're hunting by yourself, fine, uh, you know, watch the deer. And if you think that you can get to another knob for your shooting location, uh, without being seen, I, I always wait for the deer to bed. I never move on a deer that's that's up feeding. Uh, the only thing I got is if I have a, a spotter or a couple spotters where watching deer, and I know that if I can get one ridge over, depending on what the deer does, whether he beds or keeps feeding, then I'm positioned. That would be the only time that I would um, move on a deer that's that's um, you know up feeding. If you're by yourself and you spot a big buck, just be really, really patient. It's hard, but watch that buck down. Once you've watched him, watch him for 10 minutes or so and make sure, you know, a lot of times they'll bed down and like two minutes later they'll hop up, they'll walk over 10 yards because they don't like that bed. So I normally watch them for about 10, 15 minutes 
and just watch and okay he's bedded and then okay I'm going to move over into my position uh, one thing to note is when you're up high and you've got you know good optical advantage you've got a buck bedded you need to take a picture of that um, hillside from where from where you're at you need to make a mental note of okay he's between the two dead trees or he's by the big mesquite tree with the arm on the left side that's dead or he's right by the you know two-armed saguaro or he's right by the white rock in other words mark a landmark so that when because Almost always when you get over to uh, your shooting position, it changes. In other words, the hillside looks different. But if you know he's just right of the big, dead, uh, snaggly oak tree, then when you get over there, all you're doing is, okay, where's the snaggly oak tree? Okay, there it is. Okay, I know that I can't see the buck, but I know that he's you know 10 or 15 yards to the right of that. Or if you've got a big white rock or a yucca plant or, you know, I try and take a picture of it from the position and go, okay, he's just down from the big white rock and he's just below the big uh, green pine tree, the only pine tree on the hill. And then once you get over there, you've got a good sense, even if you can't see the deer, you know, okay, he's just to the right of the rock and he's just below the pine and because it always looks different from, from from another vantage point. What would you say their uh, primary uh, means of defense is? Is it, is it their sense of smell, like basically all other deer? No, I'd say eyesight. Oh, I'd really? Say eyesight, mm-hmm. eyesight, hearing, and smell. Um, yeah, they have amazing eyesight. They have an amazing sense of what's around them. That's why, you know, we always say the 300 yard, but I mean, honestly, big, big deer that Dar and I are trying to kill ourselves and with clients, I mean, depending on the client or how well someone shoots, if I can say, you know, I don't want to get within 400, I want to be, you know, 405 yards, you know, I'd like to be as far away from them as I can, as if as effective as the shooter that I'm with is. And if, you know, if I'm with a guy that, you know, shoots routinely at 450, 500 yards, and I mean is a, a dead-on shooter, then there's no reason to get any closer. I want to be as far away as I can and have a good optical advantage, good shooting position. Uh, and, you know, if, if, a, if a guy's comfortable shooting, you know, 450 yards all day long, that's where I'm going to be. I, I want to get as close as I can to efficiently kill them, but as far away as I can so that they, they're not aware that I'm there. So as we, as we wrap up the show today, do you have one last final piece of guidance that you'd give to someone that's interested in going coos deer hunting that's never done it before? Well, I mean, I, I just say you got to go and experience, you got to go do it. Um, and, most of the time, those deer will know you're there uh, if you get too close, like we talked about. And, you know, just enjoy it. it it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, piece of country where they live, uh, and they're an amazing deer. And a lot of times, you know, you get to see so much, or so much other wildlife uh, out there when you're on a cooster hunt. And, uh, you know, they're, they're going to... They're going to surprise you. They're going to, you know, do things that you just shake your head and you think, I can't believe that I was looking at that deer and then I thought he was gone and I realized he's standing in the same exact spot. He just moved his head a little differently and there he is and he just flicked his ear. can't tell you how many times I've had a buck in the binos and I look away for just a second, you know, maybe get something out of my pack and I just, I haven't even moved. I just pull my head back and look right back in my binos and I think he's gone. And then I look and look and look and look and I'm like, where did he go? And then he'll move his back leg and he's standing in the same exact spot. So they're an amazing deer. Um, I, I, I love them. I love everything about them and uh, just enjoy every year uh, getting to hunt them as much as I do. And, and uh, they're super, super fun. So how can the audience connect with you, Jay? Uh, on Instagram, uh, J Scott outdoors, uh, on Instagram. And, um, then I also have a podcast, 
uh, J. Scott Outdoors uh, Western Big Game Hunting and Fishing Podcast. Uh, they can send me an email at uh, jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. They can send me a direct message on Instagram uh, at jscottoutdoors. And, uh, yeah, I'm happy to help. I uh, love uh, helping people. I uh, love, you know, just talking about the animals that I love to hunt. And coos deer are, are one of my favorites. And, you know, I've been really – I've been chasing elk and mule deer this fall Um in Colorado at the Odd Six Ranch, and I'm back in Arizona now. I've been scouting really hard uh, for desert bighorns uh, with the with the desert sheep season starting December 1st. Uh, so it's just a great time of year, and um, look forward to uh, look forward to more hunting this fall for sure. I know how you feel. Well, uh, I'll make sure that I put uh, links to all, all your social media accounts uh, and your podcast and everything in the show notes for the audience to check out. Uh, it was great talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us to uh, talk about coos deer hunting today. All right, buddy. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate you thinking of me and um, look forward to doing it again someday. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Big Game Hunting Podcast. I hope you found my discussion with Jay to be interesting and that you learned a thing or two about coos deer hunting. Remember, a lot of this information also applies when you're hunting many other species of game. Heck, if you can find and consistently glass up coos deer, then you can probably find and glass up just about any species of North American big game. 